Psychological horror is like reaching into pitch black water, looking for something. But you don't know what, and you can't see what lurks in the water you're putting your hands into. Maybe it's the truth, maybe it's a hand that will grab you and pull you under. It's one of the most interesting types of horror, but it's also one that really struggles with coming across to its audience. It's sometimes sloppy, misunderstood, or blunt in a way that leaves the viewer rolling their eyes instead of uncomfortable in their skin. But when it works, it can affect you in a way that no other type of horror can, and there's such a wide variety of ways that psychological horror works. At the lowest level, psychological horror works by presenting a feeling, more than a straight-up frightening moment. Its goal is to unsettle the player and make them feel uncomfortable, and it does this in several ways. Silent Hill 2 follows James Sunderland, who receives a letter from his wife, Mary, who died three years ago. The letter tells him to come meet her in Silent Hill, in their special place, and James says at the start he knows it's impossible, she's dead, it can't be real. But despite this, he chooses to follow the letter anyway, driving to the remote town of Silent Hill, and leaving everything behind as he walks the forest path into town. You as the player know there's something wrong with this, the alarm bells in your mind. She's dead, she can't send him a letter. The long walk into town is weird and lonely, the fog is dense, the music plays an eerie, skulking track as the random sound of footsteps follow you through the fog. All you do is walk. You can't see too far ahead, and all the time there's the unshakable sensation that something is going to happen. But nothing ever does. The feeling of dread sinks in. Why are we doing this again? The agonizing feeling psychological horror presents is in its dread and uncertainty, that the logic behind what's happening is flawed and something is wrong. You threw some dice into a bowl and they turned into teeth. Is something wrong or were they teeth this whole time? Not knowing is what leads to the feeling. What lies at the bottom of the pitch black water you're staring into? Uncertainty and dread are two of the most typical feelings you'll find in psychological horror. When you know something the character doesn't, or can sense there's something wrong they aren't addressing. Like with James Sunderland, you know nothing is waiting for him in Silent Hill, there can't be. But on the surface, many psychological horror films and games don't make this level of sense. There's a dreamlike quality to many of them, where the conventional rules of reality break away. In the movie Eraserhead by David Lynch, after the bizarre and surreal opening six minutes, the next few scenes follow main character Henry as he walks to a destination. His path is often confusing and leaves him looking small against the looming industrial environments. The soundtrack playing heavy, droning ambience, Henry's footsteps silent against the machinery around him. feeling of dread returns. It creates a disconnect between the character and his surroundings and it feels nightmarish. Something is off, and without the reference as to what's going on or why it's like this, you're left alone with these unnerving feelings.
what can be maddening about some psychological horror is that sometimes the best answer to a question of why something is happening is... I don't know. Movies like Eraserhead have a lot of theories as to what it means. It's all symbolism to represent some aspect of director and writer David Lynch's life and fears. In his book, Catching the Big Fish, he made the scenes, put them on film, but stated he didn't understand them until later. At the time, it was just captured feelings. It meant something to him. But it doesn't need to mean something to you. Psychological horror can go fully into symbolism, experimentalism, and surrealism to achieve its goal of inflicting dread or fear by leaving the real world behind. In Adam Lost Memories, it's explained during the game's opening sequence that the experience is based on the game creator's memories of his fractured home life and features heavy themes of child abuse. But the second the opening is over, it very rarely ever states what it means that plainly, with the rest of the game leaving you alone with its atmosphere and its scenery, and you can sense in these seemingly unrelated environments of futuristic industrial laboratories and dark closed off mines that there's an overwhelming loneliness, there's trauma, there's anger, there's hopelessness, everything is dark, everything is empty. The environments mean something. You can feel it, even if it's not apparent to you. You don't need to be able to relate, you can just imagine what led to this. And that's one of psychological horror's greatest strengths, allowing the player to imagine more terrifying things than it really ever needs to show. When you see a lone wheelchair in a dark room, it's there for a reason. Emotional, environmental storytelling with nothing but a lone object in the darkness. Symbolism is one of the hallmarks of psychological horror and works well with your imagination to allow you to interpret things in your own way. Layers of Fear presents a lot of scenes in the game that represent parts of the main character, the painter's life, and how art has been what he's chased, and how art has been what's ruined his life. From the floating furniture in the basement when the piano plays a tune, to the books rushing out of the walls, and even the rats floating in the bathtub, it's all there to represent a moment, or a fear, or a feeling. Eraserhead once again has one of the more uncomfortable scenes in the film, where Henry has dinner with his girlfriend Mary and her family. There's a point where Henry is given a cooked bird, and when he cuts into it, it wiggles its legs and it bleeds and bleeds and bleeds, and across the table Mary and her mother watch it, and her mother salivates wildly and seems to find some strange pleasure in the act, and all the time the sickening slurping sound of the cooked bird invades your ears as the camera does a close-up of the blood seeping out. Eventually Mary's mother seems to be horrified and runs off. The scene is bizarre and distressing. It means something. The events are deliberate and calculated, but regardless of what it means to the casual viewer, it's horrifying. This isn't normal. What we're seeing here are the manifestations of someone's subconscious telling them something. And a lot of the horror comes from knowing that it's going somewhere. This dread is building towards something. The movie Lake Mungo is a fake documentary about a family's strange aftermath after their daughter Alice drowns in a lake. And there are several clips where you can see Alice being interviewed by a psychic and she explains to him these dreams she's been having. Would you like to tell me a little bit about what happens in these dreams? I feel like something bad is going to happen to me. I feel like something bad has happened. It hasn't reached me yet, but it's on its way. And it's getting closer. And I don't feel ready. I feel like I can't do anything.
confusing the audience with the environment is something done a lot to force them to lose grip on reality, and as a result you can feel disorientated. Visage does this with the mirrors in Dolores' chapter, as you walk through them to different points in time and locations within the house. Though, things that can be understood are things that can be mastered. The mansion in Resident Evil doesn't change, the layout remains the same, and the more you traverse it, the more you get used to it, familiar, know where things are. In Silent Hill's Midwich School, the same applies. Its environment has a map that makes sense, and you can walk back and forth between locations to solve item puzzles, until you gather the items required to enter the clock tower. As Harry Mason, you climb down a ladder, walk through a tunnel, climb up another ladder to reveal you're back at the clock tower. Inside the school, the floors have been replaced with gratings. The walls are rusty and smeared with blood. There's hung bodies chained to the walls. The soundtrack has turned into this horrific, dissonant scraping. All the doors you unlocked have moved and now your map is useless. The school isn't the school anymore, but it is. What does it represent and to who? Milk inside a bag of milk inside a bag of milk follows a girl as she goes to buy some milk for her mother, and the thought patterns, the justifications, the blending of fantasy with reality makes it hard to tell what's happening. Strange close-ups interject the conversations you have with others, her own thoughts mix up with the dialogue and you're left trying to pin down the feeling of unease, the anxiety from her strange actions. Psychological horror is there to bypass the sort of logical fear you get from more typical scenarios. Like zombies in Resident Evil, enemy soldiers in Stalker, it aims to replace those threats with the less tangible, as well as fill you with emotions and confusing experiences to bewilder the player, to toy with your perception as to what you can rely on and what you can't, what's real and what isn't, and to make you question the things you see, or trust the protagonist you're playing as. A lot of characters in psychological horror are dealing with something. There's no nice way to say it. Fears grip them, paranoia rests on their shoulders, and trauma, amnesia, and broken memories follow them to their finales, where they either confront these things or lose themselves to them. The dice turned into teeth because they were always teeth. And you get glimpses into their world bit by bit, in detention, checking this mirror in the school reveals the second voice in Ray's head, her doubts and fears speaking directly to her. It knows, she knows, but we've yet to get there. As James Sunderland recklessly jumps further and further down into these dark pits, it feels like you're symbolically exploring his own psyche, groping around in his brain to try and find what's in there, what's causing the torment that surrounds him. Your face is in the murky black water, but you still can't see. Going back to Lake Mungo, each member of the family copes with Alice's death in different ways. And arguably, the way that stands out the most is their son Matt, who turns to photography. In his sister's absence, he systematically takes pictures of the back garden every month, until his dead sister arrives in one of the photos, making everyone believe she's haunting them. And this naturally gives the family members a shock as well as a feeling of confusion. But there she is, in the picture. And this sends them off on a tangent, as they compulsively look for her in photographs and other video footage of local people in the area, until they find another supposed picture of her. It gets so bad they exhume their daughter's body to confirm it's in its grave. And of course it is. It's later revealed that Matt edited his sister Alice into these photos, which understandably upset the family and turns them against him. But he says he does it because he misses her, 
and it means a lot to him. Events like this present themselves in odd ways, and the way people deal with them is sometimes hard to stomach or puts you off the character. Their motivations are sometimes hard to understand. In Fran Bao, young Fran is a ten-year-old girl who, after witnessing the death of her parents, is taken into psychological care in the early 1930s, a famously bad time for practices in mental health. She's given tablets by a doctor to help her overcome the things she's been feeling, but the tablets end up showing her horrific images of headless animals and dark shadows that cling to her fellow patients, their problems visualised. And she establishes it herself as being a nightmare, since the supposed real world doesn't seem abnormal at all. But as the early chapters of the game go on, the question of what the tablets do comes into play more and more, with the nightmarish world they reveal staying the same, but this real world ends up showing more and more unrealistic things, from families of humanoid pine cones to giant talking ants and two-headed girls, but the moment the uneasiness came over me was taking a tablet in the giant ant's house and watching the home give way to the reveal the body of a pest exterminator with ants swarming over his rotting corpse. And I had to ask myself, are her nightmares the reality? Something that media in this genre likes to do is muddy the waters for what's really happening. In session 9, you watch several workers and their leader Gordon, who is hired to remove the asbestos from a psychiatric hospital, and as they explore, one of the others finds tapes in the basement and begins listening to them. Therapy sessions that go from 1 to 9, and as they progress through the tapes, you find out more and more about a past patient, Mary Hobbs, whose schizophrenia revealed a dangerous personality named Simon. And where do you live, Simon? I live in the weak and the wounded. Dark. Gordon seems stressed, but he's under a lot of pressure. The hospital's a strange and foreboding place, and as the story progresses, there's a mounting distrust from Gordon about the others that may be trying to hinder his progress, and moments where it seems like he's snapping under the stress, but it's hard to tell if the deteriorated halls and rooms filled with writing and haunting tales of patients' past influences are the cause, or if there's something else bothering Gordon. He sits in his car and looks out longingly to his wife and daughter, and they look back with distrust. It's very easy to say the place is haunted, that the building is the cause, that something's in there and it's affecting them. The walls speak to him, but is that all? It makes sense to find the characters you're playing as sympathetic when the trauma doesn't seem to be their fault, but this doesn't stop the main characters from coming across as the antagonists themselves, or even just being untrustworthy, their strange warped perceptions, their twisted desires and their disconnect from reality. Most of it feels wrong, and video games do an especially good job at putting you into the driver's seat. In Martha is Dead, the titular character drowns in a lake at the start, found on the shoreline by her sister Julia, the main character, who upon finding her parents, assumes her dead sister's identity. This is already a strange act to keep up with, and she keeps it going uncomfortably through the game, but what pushes it over the line is her deteriorating psyche. 
It has her perform a strange series of bizarre and uncomfortable things, starting with the guilt-ridden dreams where she removes her sister's dead face and puts it over her own, stealing her identity in a morbid way. But soon the dreams become real, as she becomes fascinated by the notion that her sister Martha was pregnant, and goes to the family crypt to find out. The section is horrifying, as everything in you is screaming, don't do this, but you're trapped playing as the villain as she dissects her sister and removes a fetus. Just any canvas. I had to find a knife. Not one of those bread ones. It needed to be as sharp as a razor. So I used a razor, in fact, and then carefully flayed the skin. Booze helped keep my hand steady. All the way through layers of fear you hear in the voice of the protagonist, the painter, of the things he's done. Collecting a jar of blood reveals he drained it from a corpse. Picking up a piece of skin you hear that he's using it as a canvas. His deranged butchering of an individual in the name of art is repulsive and shocking. But it's too late. These things have already been done. And going back to the canvas over and over to apply bone dust and blood and even an eye to the painting isn't going to make it what he thinks. It's not art and it never will be. You know this, but you can't do anything else. You will complete the painting. Your wavering faith in James Sunderland continues to deteriorate through Silent Hill 2 as he meets other people who are experiencing troubles of their own. From Angela, who he finds laying in front of a mirror with a knife, to Eddie, who's vomiting in a toilet not far from the corpse of a man. And the things James says to them is revealing, not about them, but about him, to the point where it seems that Angela is more afraid of him than she is of hurting herself. When a near perfect, albeit more sexualized, clone of his wife appears in a seemingly abandoned town full of monsters, he just accepts it and goes with her, even when she points out that he himself said his wife is dead. James is so devoted to the notion that the letter he received is real that his doubts are dissuaded. It almost screams to you that something is wrong, something is off, it can't be real, but he is headed down this path and you can't stop him. The skin crawling feeling that psychological horror can present in this way lingers long after you finish playing the game or watching the film. And some of it feels worse because you took part in it. You led them to this, the path they were always going down. There comes a moment in the story that the character confronts their trauma. 
the moment where the dam breaks down and shows them for what they did, or what happened to them. And it's one of the most pivotal parts of the story, coming to terms with it. This part of the video will contain the heaviest spoilers. If you've not played or watched any of the things I've spoken about so far, then it's time to stop watching. But if you've made it this far, then thank you. Not many stories in psychological horror have good endings. Either they are redeemed, or they are consumed. This is often where the genre is handled poorly, with many endings in media being underwhelming to say the least, and some reducing everything the character struggled for for a simple conclusion feels unrewarding. Many characters cannot escape what they've started, and Silent Hill 2 has many endings, determined on by what you do throughout the game. But as it nears the end, you can examine the letter you received at the start of the game, and it plainly tells you, the stationery is blank. There was no letter, just a man who returned to the hotel he spent time with his wife in before she died. But it's more insidious than that. The letter just confirms that something is wrong, but the root cause of it stems from more. James's wife Mary was sick with an incurable disease. He says it at the start, but never gives up hope that somehow she'll be alive in this nightmare. When he gets to the hotel, he finds a videotape. A strange home movie plays that cuts up the memories of his wife when she was healthy, with the footage of him killing her. And whilst this videotape is probably also not real, you know his psyche has given to him the source of his guilt. Here it is, the root cause. And that's the reason for the town being like it is. For Maria, the sexualized clone to die over and over is James robbing himself of what he desired and torturing him for what he did even if he did it to free her from the pain of dying from the illness, he can't escape what he's done and the town won't let him either. The plot twist is the most powerful move a psychological horror game can pull. Gordon is a man who's under a lot of stress, and whilst he started off seeming a little troubled, the spiralling really comes from everything, from his distrust in his co-workers to the stress of his job, the mounting pressure his financial problems, and sitting in his car, watching his wife from a distance that pushes him over the edge. He's never even heard the tapes, but he's heard Simon's voice. Hello, Gordon. Cody? It's me, man. Come on. His repressed memories leak out of the screen and the lies he tells himself. He turns around and finds a dead co-worker's body and Phil tells him he did it, but then Gordon realises that Phil isn't even there. Erase Ahead is assumed to be about Henry's inability to deal with fatherhood. He has a deformed, mutated baby, a sultry neighbour who he lusts after, and a woman in his radiator who tells him to kill the child. And throughout the story, Henry deals mostly with his disgust and disdain for his own child. He can't stop it crying, he can't go out or live his life, he doesn't know what it wants, he's stuck with it.
And as the mounting anger builds, Henry cuts open the bandages that wrap up the child, revealing nothing but organs inside. The child is without skin, and giving in to his cowardice, he stabs it with the scissors in a brutal act that kills the baby in a strange and nightmarish way. He's free, but disturbed by his own actions, the world breaks, and from here on, it's more surreal as the elements seem to lose control and his world falls apart. And just like that, you reach the bottom of the dark water, and all you see is yourself. Psychological horror struggles to have good endings. Time may heal all wounds, but some scars remain. James Sunderland has endings where he and Laura walk off together, and others where the guilt consumes him and he drives his car into the lake. In a bittersweet end to Lake Mungo, the family eventually move on leaving the house behind as they go on to live their lives elsewhere. Whilst the horror of what happened to Alice still lurks in their mind, they feel like it's been resolved. In a session with the same psychic that spoke to Alice, her mother recalls a dream she had, where she explores the old house they lived in, and she walks into Alice's room to find she isn't there. There's something warm about this feeling to her, and Alice's mother feels relieved feeling that she's left the horror behind her as she leaves the house. In a tape before she died, Alice recalls a similar dream, where her mother walks into the room she's in, says nothing, fails to notice her, and then turns around and leaves. She's upset by this, her mother walking out of the house and vanishing. And the film ends by showing a picture of the remaining family, smiling and happy, ready to move on, with a vague figure in the window just behind them. The ending leaves you to stew in your realisation. They may be happy, but she's alone. Sometimes the best you can hope for is for it to end. Eventually, in Adam Lost Memories, his abuse ended in a hazy, scratchy, half-remembered moment of flashing police lights and looming buildings. Life does indeed go on, but the characters that don't make it to the end of the story are the ones that you'll remember the most. It may be disappointing, and you may feel like there was more you could have done. It's deeply saddening, but their nightmare is over. Thank you for watching today's video. This was a real strain to make and I want to thank the patrons profusely for their support during this time. If you like this video, there is a longer, darker version on Patreon for those interested in seeing it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you next time. I lost my way, lost my way